Okay. Um, and can you switch on the... Okay. <clears throat> so uh, we are setting up our live stream on YouTube, on uh, Mumala's YouTube channel, where you can actually uh, see the, the screen recording which through which I'll be talking about the... Uh, the project online and we'll start in another 30 seconds or so um, yeah so I just want to we're gonna we'll start yeah okay so um, just starting with a quick word of thank you uh, thank you for uh, joining me uh, in this walkthrough where I will be talking about my project 256 Million Colors of Violence, which is a part of, uh, a central part of my exhibition, uh, is, there a room with is There a Room With Just a Color at uh, Mumala in Helsinki. Uh, the time is two o'clock here and it's a sunny day. And thank you for joining me and uh, I hope that you will have questions and uh, that I will be able to answer them in some sense or some meaningful way. All right, so I'm going to start with just talking about the project. Um, there is a short text here on the website itself and just to elaborate on what is already here, 256 Million Colors of Violence is a survey-based interactive archival research project. So what that means is that essentially the core of the project is a, a questionnaire. And the questionnaire is uh, presented here as a diverse communication interface. And um, the idea is that the questionnaire is a collection of various questions, 50 of them, collected from various uh, spaces, various bureaucratic forms, social media accounts. These are questions that you would uh, be confronted with, that you would come across, that you would engage with uh, if you want to open a new bank account, if you want to uh, get a new uh, passport or renew your passport, if you want to get a visa done, or something as simple as uh, if you want to open a new account uh, on Facebook or Google, Gmail, whatever. Uh, these are very everyday questions that we are confronted with on a regular basis. And the idea of the questionnaire actually uh, ties into this idea of why, um, uh, why, why do these questions become uh, seeds of the f or, or representations of the forms of violence that we are uh, surrounded with which are often invisible, indirect, uh, normalized, um, normalized, normative, disproved yet in practice, banal, obscure, unheard of, and unthinkable. Uh, forms of violence that are direct, structural, and cultural. And by direct, I mean that they are tangible, visible forms of violence like hitting, spitting, bullying, um, the, the most obvious, in a way, uh, forms of violence that we see, hear, and experience. Structural, in the sense that they are uh, fairly invisibilized, uh, part of uh, institutional forms of violence. Uh, these are in, 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 in methods of patriarchy, in methods of uh, institutional racism, in methods of... Um, 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 misogyny, sexism, um, they do not have direct, uh, direct physical effect, but they are very much real and a part of our everyday lives. And then cultural violence, which are normalized to the point of having become invisible in such ways that we no longer see them as being violent anymore. 
patriarchy, uh, culturally um, culturally uh, normalized forms of violence, uh, which which have become so seeped into our lives that for us it it becomes even difficult to think of them as acts of violence. And these are, uh, these are the kind of questions that uh, the, the questionnaire is also trying to, to uh, address. To quickly talk about the history of the project, uh, the project actually is a response to specific events that uh, happened in, uh, in India. Uh, immediately after the historic Maligam bomb blasts in 2008. And the Maligam bomb blasts were uh, a series of two bomb blasts that occurred in 2008 uh, uh, in, in a small town of Maligam, which is very close to uh, the city of Bombay in Maharashtra. And uh, this was in a way the first time when uh, this idea of um, uh, Hindutva-fueled forms of terror and violence became a thing. Uh, in even initially, the uh, anti-terrorist squad identified uh, members of a uh, student Islamic uh, organization called Simi as being the perpetrators of these bomb blasts. But further investigation revealed that there were um, there was this organization called Abhinav Bharat, which is a right-wing um, Hindutva-based organization that was behind these bomb blasts. And that actually presented India with this idea of uh, Hindutva-fueled terror network that had largely remained invisible up to this point. And so in 2009, the Home Minister of, that, uh, of, of India at that time Mr. P. J P. <coughs> Mr. P. Chidambaram, um, in an address to the uh, police commissioner's gathering, uh, spoke about the presence of saffron violence and saffron terror. And this uh, term, saffron terror, was something that became uh, the subject of a major um, issue, where there were several um, uh, several legal cases registered against Mr. Chidambaram. Uh, and to a point where even members of his own political party condemned the statement saying that there is no color of violence, there is no color of terror, and if there is a color of terror, then it is black. And uh, so the project, so 256 million colors of violence as a project actually takes that statement and upturns it on its head saying that there is a color of violence and that they are in fact, um, they are in fact unique to each individual's own lived experience. And that lived experience is measurable in the context of various different parameters that an individual has uh, either gone through in their lives or experienced or uh, which form several parts of their own identity formations. Um, and these are, for example, uh, gender, uh, sexual preference, sexual orientation, uh, education, um, these can be uh, in, in the form of wh what are uh, their education backgrounds, their income, their uh, social status uh, or perceived social status, um, their uh, social class, their working background. Um, so, so essentially, the the questionnaire is a list of uh, these um, various lived experiences, and almost trying to actually look at how these lived lived experiences can form some kind of a data set, uh, which can be represented through uh, the color of, of or their selected color of violence. So just quickly to kind of go into uh, the project and the questionnaire, um, I want to first begin with this part of the website which talks about how to participate. And of course the first, um, the first uh, um, statement over here is, is almost self-defeating because if you are already here, you will have been at uh, 
on the website, which is www.256millioncolorsofviolence.com. Um, it then describes the, the project uh, very briefly that the homepage describes, sorry, displays short uh, changing excerpts uh, from uh, the artist statement and the extended artist statement. Uh, the idea is that these are key, key ideas uh, of the project and uh, in a way they introduce you without having to read the text in its entirety. Um, moving forward, to, to participate, you would click participate. Uh, once you agree to the terms and conditions, the website will redirect you to the questionnaire. And uh, this is what I will do right now. So this is the uh, letter of consent. Uh, there are terms and conditions over here which I hope that you will go through. Um, the terms and conditions are in a way designed to, to explain uh, the fact that the project is going to remain, or the entries that people participate with, the information that they, pres uh, they give us, is going to remain uh, completely anonymous. Uh, the only response from this is the color that you will select. Uh, question number 47A, and the reason that you select, uh, or the reason for why you have selected that color, question 47B, that is made public uh, on our website and through various iterations of uh, the installations. So for example, uh, these are all colors that have been submitted by the different participants, and in a way, these are also responses of why they have selected the colors that they have selected. And these selections or these reasons actually are reflective in a way of the mindset of the people, uh, their uh, thinking process, the fact that for many of them, the colors that they have selected are personal experiences um, or personal lived experiences uh, many of these colors are uh, political in nature. Many of these are intuitively selected. Uh, many of these are uh, reflections of some kind of uh, uh, events that they have gone through which may, uh, may, which may be uh, some reflective of some kind of an ex traumatic experience. Uh, moving into then the questionnaire, and uh, once you select these terms and conditions, you can, uh, once you accept them, you will move into the first question, which is your email and your name. I'm just going to type in my email ID over here, which is Ali Akbar Mehta at, oops, oh shit, I always get uh, confused by the at the rate, so Ali Akbar Mehta, um, no, no, yeah, at uh, gmail.com, and my full name, Ali Akbar Mehta, and I save continue. Uh, please do remember to save and not just move forward because moving forward is just. Uh, allowing you to go through the different questions without having to respond. Uh, only when you save uh, your response will it get saved <coughs> into the database of the questionnaire. And very quickly, just want to go through this button over here, which allows you to see the different questions. Uh, so we have right from prefix or salutation or title, uh, suffix, which is your post-nominal letters, uh, pronouns, uh, asking if you have changed your name or any aliases that you are known by, uh, date of birth, gender identity, sexual orientation, race, blood type, height, weight, skin tone, dexterity or handedness. This is basically whether you are left-handed, right-handed, ambidextrous. Uh, ethnic group, any uh, distinguishing features or visible mask, mark, <coughs> marks, uh, your mother tongue, any other languages you speak, um, relationship status, number of children, education status, so on and so forth. And these are very much uh, designed to reflect on 
how these questions become signifiers of of violence, whether through um, marginalization, alienation, otherness, uh, any kind of segregation. These are, in a way, markers, yes, of identity, but also markers of of uh, difference makers um, through which the idea is for us to understand how these are going to be ways in which um, we reveal certain differences which are also exploited uh, in our everyday lives. So. Um, a little more about each of these can be found over here in uh, these notes which accompany each question. So these are the uh, question notes. Um, you can read more and some of these are short, some of these are very long. Um, and here the idea is for me to present my thinking in terms of why I find these questions to be violent. So for example, uh, prefixes or uh, titles and salutations are primarily a patronic, patronymic form of addressing individuals, meaning that they are derived from father or uh, a paternal ancestor. So the, the inherent foundation for uh, titles and salutations are patriarchal. And that already is a very much form of the, the way we uh, have normalized this form of this kind of structural violence where whether in uh, informal contexts, working contexts, corporate contexts, uh, contexts of, um, um, uh, of, of military uh, hierarchies um, or social hierarchies, we actually have very much normalized the way that these are very patriarchal uh, or, or patronymic um, forms of addresses. And also the fact that these, these forms of addresses have, are rooted in aristocrat, uh, aristocratic and monarchic uh, uh, systems of heraldry, which means that they do give a certain kind of order of, um, order of class, order of um, social stratification. And in participating in this, uh, for example, uh, something like lady, uh, is subservient to the idea of Lord um, uh, in, a, in a very gender specific way. Uh, but um, there are several that uh, you can actually go through uh, which, which reveal a certain kind of a sense, sense of structural violence. Um, these three dots on the side are essentially notes for the um, each of the options. So you can, so the idea is that because there are so many different notes, uh, in our first iteration of the website, uh, these notes were not present. And so what happened or the feedback that I received was, uh, yes, it's, it's revealing a certain kind of uh, uh, extensive nature of the different ways in which we can answer a lot of these questions, but, um, participants felt that they did not know where to begin um, their, their journey or their process of understanding what a lot of these different terms mean. So um, in the last three years of when the project was displayed and presented first in uh, Third Space, uh, Third Space Gallery in Helsinki in 2016, the last three years of work has actually gone into building these uh, um, this extensive archive of notes that are embedded into each of the options and each of the questions. Um, so you can actually uh, look at different, um, uh, the different uh, uh, options and actually read about what they mean. And they, <coughs> they, um, uh, these, these options actually move from uh, things that are very commonly known or commonly understood uh, to um, forms which uh, or options which are uh, obscure, uh, op options which are uh, not really understood in the in everyday contexts. Um, so the idea is that 
it allows participants to remain within the format of the questionnaire and uh, but more importantly that it presents uh, the participants with a certain kind of uh, archive uh, of, of information, an introductory archive of information. And uh, in principle or ethically, this is a very important uh, thing for me to do because, um, because um, surveys and these kind of questionnaire questionnaires actually are also rooted into bureaucratic uh, systems as tools for data collection and data gathering and now uh, we know that uh, there are also tools for data farming so uh, the project is also trying to subvert this um, this this tool the survey questionnaire uh, from a bureaucratic and governmental tool of data collection as a one-way stream of information into a, a two-way um, stream of an exchange and, and hopefully a, an equal exchange of uh, information and uh, hopefully a equal or, or, or setting it up as, a, as a, a tool for diverse communication creating an, ex an, an equal exchange. So although we are asking people to, uh, um, uh, to, to give us this information through participation, the idea is that we are also uh, uh, trying to provide information in return and create that sense of equilibrium. So um, suffix, again, is... Um, is, is a, a form that defines a certain kind of an order of precedence, a sequential hierarchy of uh, nominal importance, um, of person based on conferred honor, writs, fraternity, uh, membership of elite and exclusive groupings, or um, simply closed groupings. Um, and this, uh, it's, it's tackling this idea of merit, is also uh, tackling this idea of um, of, of ancestry and uh, social currency that is transferred from one generation to another. Um, so I'm going to well, select one and move forward for now. Um, again, then the idea of pronoun is um, uh, is an is a very important uh, part of how. Uh, pronouns and uh, uh, a certain lack of understanding of how pronouns are to be used or uh, ought to be used is a form is a form of violence for people who uh, who do not um, um, uh, identify with the the pronoun the, with the gender binary. Um, this, for example, means that although his him, um, he, his, him, and she, her, sorry. Uh, the, the masculine and the feminine um, pronouns are most commonly used. Uh, many people do not identify with them. And uh, the experience of um, going through these pronouns, and there are several of them, uh, it also kind of makes visible and at least to me it made visible of the fact that there is this ongoing uh, discourse, there's this ongoing uh, discussion and a need for people to um, to create forms of addressal which uh, essentially is seeking for a certain kind of a fit with their own identity uh, and, and an acceptance of their identity uh, from a larger group of people, a larger family, a larger community um, and, and society at large. And there are many forms of uh, pronouns that uh, have become uh, a part of this kind of uh, uh, discussion on what it means to uh, address individuals in a certain way. And this then is also a movement to the next question. Well, not the next question, we get to that. Um, 
this this question of have you ever changed your name is a very commonly asked uh, question in um, uh, in in government bureaucratic or uh, banking conditions um, and this form of identity also is um, or aliases is also uh, from this context that if you have changed your name that there has been some kind of a um, uh, lack of credibility uh, especially in the context of online spaces our online identities or, or internet identities, um, it, it, at least in the initial um, uh, period, in the initial er era of the first internet, the online identities gave a certain kind of a form of ex escape. It, it created a certain kind of an anonymity that people were immediately unprepared for, but also embraced as uh, a form of alter alterity. Um, but unfortunately, in our current uh, scenario of the Internet 2.0, or even in our real, real world uh, scenarios, uh, the idea of having alternate identities or multiple identities is something that is frowned upon and um, becomes a, a point of debate. Uh, it, it, it is this this idea of an alternate identity is 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 seen to be a direct attack on credibility on legitimacy and this is something that uh, this question or these two sets of questions of uh, changing your name or uh, changing your identity is is essentially designed to uh, reflect upon and to reveal uh, then again, we have the standard questions, date of birth. Um, <clears throat> oh, one standard question, date of birth. And then, of course, uh, this idea, this, this question of gender is something that is, um, it exists in, in all forms everywhere. State your gender would be a very straightforward question to expect in any kind of a questionnaire, any kind of a form, any kind of a survey. But uh, for me, what is important is that where you have, uh, in most survey questions, uh, you have male, female, and if we are lucky, other is included, almost thrown in. Uh, but at least in the, in the context of gender, and this is something that has, that I came across in my three years of researching, um, the, human right, the, the UN Human Rights Commission actually uh, recognizes 67 different forms of gender. And uh, so in the first iteration of the website, we uh, put that in as uh, uh, a series of different options that people could, could select. And as a way of uh, familiarizing people or, uh, or uh, presenting to people the fact that, yes, they, that there are more than two genders, that, that we are way beyond this gender binary, uh, but also that um, this idea of third gender is in itself um, uh, an oversimplification. And one needs to look at, the diff at, at uh, gender identities in, in a much more nuanced way. So um, in the last three years, again, uh, the process of um, of, of uh, populating this uh, with uh, what these actually mean has been a, a large task. Uh, also because the idea of gender uh, is a very fluid discussion in the sense that it is constantly updating itself. It is constantly moving into a greater nuanced conversation about what does gender really mean beyond uh, the binary of male, female. Um, and, and also that the fact that this term third gender is in no way um, enough to actually encompass the large diversity and plurality of identities um, that uh, we can actually start looking at. Um, so this, uh, of course, is a very important part of the questionnaire for me. Um, and and on one hand, or at least the first section of this gender identity is looking at um, 
uh, gender from uh, this con from the context of um, a, a scientific understanding or even uh, a medical understanding of uh, uh, of gender. Uh, but then beyond that, there is a large list or an extensive list of additional gender identifying terms, which is also reflective of the way in which people through various communities have started uh, looking at what can gender really explode into um, and uh, can it really mean that it is such a nuanced form of uh, identity that uh, no two people may have a combination of, of the same. And so um, this is one of the questions where you can actually select multiple genders because you may not really feel, or you may not identify with just one gender at a time. And so I will move on to the next question. And uh, this is a new question in, the, in this particular iteration of uh, uh, the questionnaire. Uh, I did not have a question for sexual orientation in the last version because um, I made the same mistake of uh, clubbing gender identity and sexual orientation within one uh, question. And this is something that um, we do very often without really realizing uh, about it. Mm. And so again, um, the first uh, set is looking at uh, sexuality from a very specific context of um, what is conservatively understood as uh, sexual uh, um, identities. But then again, the additional sexual ident sexually identifying terms uh, are looking at uh, ways in which sexuality is being explored today uh, in, in very different ways, in ways uh, which make sense to the people who, who need uh, to have these, um, uh, these very nuanced and detailed forms of uh, expressions of their own identity. Um, so again, to move forward, race is, um, is, is a very interesting question for me. And for me, the, it's, it's, it's a bit, um, well, for a lack of a better word, it's a bit crazy that we still use race as a certain kind of an identifier uh, because we know that uh, scientifically, biologically, race has been disproved. And so what we are left is a certain kind of a social understanding of race. We are left with a certain kind of a social usage uh, or, or a usage in social context, which, which very easily has translated into forms of racism uh, as a certain kind of a social reality. Um, a lot of forms, government forms, for example, uh, the, the the uh, immigration form for the United States of America, the ICE form, uh, asks people their race, uh, but what it really means is for people to, um, to fill in their ethnic identity. But uh, this, is all, this is just one way in which uh, race has become, uh, we have started using race inter interchangeably with ethnicity, and I just wanted to kind of put forward this um, this uh, question over here to uh, to to really make visible the fact that um, there has been this uh, move towards um, racial and ethnic discrimination when we talk about race as a certain kind of a. Uh, um, uh, race as a certain kind of a reality that we are confronted with, especially in terms of the ways that we have been marginalized or othered or uh, alienated. And forms of uh, racial uh, discrimination are, for example, colorblindness, nativism, xenophobia, otherness, segregation, hierarchical ranking, supremacism, and institutional racism. 
And these are all uh, forms of uh, racism that we are confronted with. Um, these, this, uh, wo these are options which in a way are um, um, what you would have found in a very classical conservative form of racial uh, identity that was prevalent in the early, um, well, in the late 90s and uh, even up till the uh, early 2000s. Of course, these are no longer um, scientifically or biologically accepted uh, forms of identity, uh, but hey, we still use them. So they're, they're here for just uh, to make people realize that these are, this is a irrelevant question, but a question that is asked regularly uh, every day to people all over the world. Um, yeah, and if we can, you know, discriminate against uh, people on the base of race, which is obviously not a scientific fact, why not discriminate uh, each other on the basis of blood type and uh, there has been a blood type related discrimination that is prevalent in in many parts of uh, Japan, South Korea and and, and uh, this idea of a certain kind of a blood type or uh, purity is also something that we talk about uh, in many many uh, cultures across the world this blood purity is um, is, is an idea that has been so culturally normalized in our, uh, in, in, in so many different cultures that it does not even come across as being violent in any way. So I just wanted to put this question here just to uh, talk about this and, and to make it visible. Um, again, height is a very uh, standard question Weight is a very standard question, but of course, uh, weight, the question of weight uh, is, is we know, or it, it is one of the most uh, popularly understood forms of uh, uh, structural uh, violence that uh, uh, we are familiar with uh, in terms of fat shaming, uh, skinny shaming, fatism. Um, we understand it because it has been in, in, in conversation for uh, a while now, but just wanted to put it here as a way to, to kind of reflect on that question. Um, skin tone, again, a question that is uh, related to things like, well, race, of course, ethnicities, yes. Uh, but also the fact that um, wanted to put in this very particular um, scale of, of color, uh, which is the Fitzpatrick scale. And the Fitzpatrick scale, you can well uh, read it about it here as well. Uh, the Fitzpatrick scale was actually uh, devised by uh, racial scientists to actually um, uh, to to. To, to create a, a racial hierarchy based on skin color. And that is known as colorism or shadism and is a form of prejudice or, or discrimination that um, is, is prevalent all over the world. Uh, the Fitzpatrick scale was actually um, devised by Thomas Fitzpatrick in 1975. Um, and it's... Um, uh, I think I have, yeah, just got a bit confused, sorry. <clears throat> uh, it's, it's, it's designed to actually uh, measure your skin tone uh, in an area that you would not generally get uh, sunburn. So it's designed to be uh, measuring um, uh, your skin from your uh, upper arm, the upper underarm. And uh, the way this system of uh, measurement was devised that uh, Fitzpatrick actually designed a series of 23, sorry, uh, 35 different uh, uh, tinted glass, um, uh, tinted glass uh, 
um, panels that would be um, compared to to different individuals, and this actually formed the basis of a of a, of a racial uh, science uh, a foundation for racial science that actually has led to things like um, uh, white suprematism has led to um, whiteness as a, a, as an indicator, but also has led to the entire um, mm, the the way in which we have understood race for a very long time. On the other hand, the the Van Lucian chromatic scale, which is a series of uh, six uh, tints, um, is actually designed to. Um, to, to measure a, an individual's skin tone and their reaction to ultraviolet light. So it's not a racial, racially motivated or a racial science motivated uh, scale of color, but is actually designed to talk about how a individual's skin tone is um, resistant to, uh, to, to sunburn uh, and to skin cancer. And this actually has been the foundation of uh, our emoji color schemes that we are very familiar with. All right, just wanted to put that little bit of trivia in there. Um, moving into things like um, a question of handedness, again, um, there is a very, and this is me talking from personal experience, being a left-handed myself, uh, there is a very strong sense of cultural violence because it's been so normalized, cultural violence, structural violence that uh, is uh, a part of the everyday living of most left-handed people. Um, there are uh, religious um, taboos against left-handed people. Uh, being left-handed is extremely frowned upon uh, for example, in Islamic culture, um, to uh, the point where the uh, children are um, uh, uh, are bullied um, mentally and physically into changing their handedness from being left-handed to right-handed, and that actually can have very long-lasting traumatic impacts. Uh, in their uh, growing up and adult lives. So this is a very, a very real form of discrimination and I just wanted to put that in over here because although this is, a this is not really a question that is asked in most uh, questionnaires, but it is a source of uh, a, a form of, of, of emotional uh, cultural trauma that many of us are faced with. And you can read more about it here. So I'm going to move forward. Again, ethnic groups are, um, uh, in a way, um, to the way in which we can actually measure our diversity is in the form of the long list of um, different ethnicities that uh, exist. Um, these are linguistic, um, culinary, Mm, uh, and other social uh, ways in which we uh, have learned to demarcate ourselves from others. Um, there, there can be uh, ethnic differences um, within just a couple of miles from one ethnic uh, grouping to another. So um, this idea of ethnicity is not really to do with uh, nations. They're not to, to, to do with um, uh, smaller uh, states or prov provinces, but uh, you can find ethnic differences, uh, differences just from village to village in ways people uh, choose to identify themselves with. And so in a way, this is a very important like for me, it's a very important way in which we can actually start taking ownership of um, ways in which we identify ourselves. But also one of the things that is very important for this questionnaire to do is to start presenting uh, each of the participants, each uh, member of the audience with 
the extreme diversity that exists, the extreme plurality that exists, um, not just in terms of options, but these options actually translate into forms of identity for people. So, um, and, and this is maybe something that I should have addressed right in the beginning, but I can talk about it right now that uh, the the that this questionnaire is um, designed or uh, based on this idea of um, or the or the structure of how the early text based video games would function where uh, you design multiple options uh, or narrative options uh, within the game and uh, based on what the player chooses the the storyline or the narrative of the game moves forward accordingly and and so in a way this is also um, the idea is that of course you would not have more than uh, one or two or maybe uh, in some multiple choice questions a few different uh, ways in which you ident to identify yourself or in which or ways in which you choose to construct your identity but uh, it is also to present people with the fact that beyond their own choices there are uh, uh, a vast number of uh, different ways in which people may choose to identify themselves with and so <clears throat> uh, of course so um, um, there are um, so well i've i've answered some but just move forward in others so you see that um, these are not answered and not saved in the database. So when selecting colors, please save after every question. Uh, but this, this question of any other distinguishing features or marks is actually a closure to this uh, second section of, um, of, of identity in terms of gender, sexual orientation, race, blood type, height, weight, skin tone, uh, dexterity and ethnic group uh, and and the idea is that here then this question is essentially asking people to um, to tell us a little more about themselves beyond the, the ways in which we have uh, uh, created this um, these, these set of options also to say that uh, along with each um, uh, each of these options, there is always going to be uh, a question or, or an option of other. So you can select other and type your own answer, type your own truth. And uh, I'm going to move forward now. Again, like with ethnicity uh, language, and here the first one is your mother tongue. Um, language, again, defines us in very different ways. There are multiple languages. And uh, one of the most uh, fun things to do uh, in terms of uh, putting together this research has been in to just find out uh, ways in which we uh, identify with uh, different, um, uh, different uh, markers of identity in so many different ways. So language is here, I mean, there are, I think, um, 217 or 300 different languages. So please go through, with, go through them and see uh, what are the different forms of obscure languages that are, uh, and, and by obscure, I mean that some of them are sp spoken only by two or three or five people. Um, of course, uh, Many of these are uh, very known, um, popular. We uh, are familiar with them as languages. Uh, so yeah, so uh, the first one is um, your mother tongue. And the next one is the other tongues or other languages that you speak. Um, I have not uh, put in the note for this, but just to talk about how uh, languages can be a very important part of this uh, discourse on, um, uh, on on structural or epistemic violence uh, as a form of structural discrimination. Um, language is a very important part of how we tend to discriminate against people. 
and also the power relations or the hierarchies that languages have um, been structured into by ourselves is in itself a very violent form of discrimination so we just wanted to put that uh, in there it doesn't exist on the questionnaire but it soon will um yeah so this is a very classic facebook question um your relationship status and again the idea is to be able to uh, go through with go through in 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 um uh in in a way how um, these questions also can become specifically forms of violence uh and what does it really mean to to say that you are in a relationship for example um or or um, that uh, you are single and what does it really mean uh to be in uh, different forms of um, relationships uh that can be a little complicated um but i hope that you will go through go through these very standard question how many children you have um going to move forward this uh, i've already taken a lot of time um, educational status these don't have any um uh, uh any any notes uh, so you can simply select on one that uh, one or many that uh, you can that you feel that you uh, um well not identify with but these are degrees and things like that uh just wanted to 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 put into perspective this kind of uh, uh the ways in which we segregate ourselves in 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 uh in in ways that we have received education or in in ways in which we uh think about our qualifications at least in the context of education mm. very standard questions of uh education background uh high school college university um moving again uh, as an extension of that this idea of qualification and so what does it mean for us to be qualified or less than qualified or under qualified or unqualified when we talk about education qualifications uh, and how that translates into a form of violence for many of us uh, especially in um, relation to uh, and and often this relation to uh dominant uh, education uh qualification systems or qualifiers of uh education whether it's in the context of a uh, a western education but also in the context of how uh southern or non western forms of um uh, educations do not really fit very well uh into into some forms of qualifiers within the western education system um i will not ramble on too much about this a note on this i will put soon mm, moving on to your occupation occupation type and again here the idea is to through well so the idea is that these are options that you would find uh in um, that that i found in uh, my own bank uh back in india my own banks um bank account opening form and uh these i this these uh, sectors of 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 occupation are uh, uh sometimes known but also often not really understood in terms of what uh they really mean and um, one thing that really kind of was important for me to expand upon was this idea of housewife and this actually was in uh hey uh this was in uh, the bank account opening form and i find it a bit problematic so i have i have added homemaker because um yes that is important and required um this is also one of the options that is most um that i have spent some time on uh, looking at it as uh 
looking at or even trying to um, talk about uh, the ways in which it is problematic. So um, please go through these notes. It is also looking at and hinting at feminist econ uh, economics. And for me, that's a very important part in how we are looking at the idea of economics uh, today and also the idea of occupation. So that's a bit of a shout out to feminist economics right here. Um, and also the, the fact that uh, we have moved beyond this idea of uh, a, a gendered uh, representation of what a person doing at home uh, or, or managing a home uh, does. Uh, we have, we, these, these are all pretty much in, in usage today, but we tend to stick to, uh, at least in popular usage, tend to stick to this idea of the housewife as a very gendered uh, occupation. And um, maybe it's also important to talk about how like this particular gendered uh, usage of, of what a homemaker does is also very much in um, use in many, many uh, different industries, uh, fields of work, occupations. Um, and and uh, um, I think uh, it is very important for us to start realizing and uh, sensitizing ourselves to the fact that um, gendered uh, job profiles or gendered names of job profiles a restrict a certain kind of an idea of what that job um, uh, the, 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 what that job really entails and um, because of a long lasting structural form of um, marginalization and a structural hierarchy uh, that has been built into these gendered uh, 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 job descriptions especially uh, for people who do not uh, identify as um, cis males, um, that is a very, very large obstacle to overcome. So I think this is something that we all need to overcome, or not overcome, this is something that we all need to sensitize ourselves uh, regarding. So yes, I'm just gonna move forward. Uh, again, these are uh, profession, title, designation, uh, designed to uh, be an extension of uh, the question of an occupation type and um, really asking you to look at uh, your own profession field, uh, your own title, uh, again from what I said right now about it's, it's uh, how, how it is uh, gender limiting, how it's, um, uh, how it may or may not have certain kind of uh, biases and prejudices built into it just in term of, terms of its designation or its title. So yeah, moving in. Yeah, so um, annual income, again, a very standard question in most uh, banking and bureaucratic forms. Um, for me, the idea is not to uh, ask about how much you earn the this is not an this is not a piece of information that I want for myself uh, per se but it's also just simply to make people aware of uh, their own um, uh, economic privilege and the lack of privilege in the context of uh, yeah so my um, Instagram uh, video live video has ended. I'm just gonna put that aside and continue. Uh, yeah. So as I was saying, this whole idea of uh, the annual income for me is is just a way for people and participants to really reflect on uh, the idea of economic privilege. So uh, the options over here, and you can see that there are many, 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 many options, and you would ask me why. And so now I put this question, or this, uh, sorry, uh, this note over here. Um, the annual income is actually asking people to select a number of their own annual income. And uh, if let's select one at random, this one, uh, 
if you select on the note, it basically will tell you that your annual income is the estimated minimum wage of a particular country. And it gives a certain uh, figure, which is the, min the annual minimum wage amount and the rate at which that is calculated. And um, it's essentially just to make people really f realize um, how, how it would work uh, and how um, one's own relationship of like, e economic relationship to maybe another person's economic uh, situation can, can maybe sensitize us on our own forms of privilege. This particular number over here, which is um, uh, two, two million seven hundred and fifty-seven thousand um, dollars. This is essentially the salary bracket of the top zero point one percent of the world, uh, and right at the bottom over here is no or well as you can see the number is that there is no minimum wage so the minimum wage is zero yeah so i'm just going to move on from there um again this idea of class is a very politically charged question but here i've broken it up into two forms class according to social status and class according to working conditions and in a way this is largely to kind of um present to the participants the fact that this idea of uh, working conditions has a certain kind of, um, uh, of course, there is certain kind of a um, background to this in terms of how people were uh, segregated in terms of their job profile. So again, that's a occupation type and a hierarchy based on, uh, on working conditions that is presented over here. But, but also that this this, um, this social status and this idea of uh, uh, what, what is your area of influence, what is your area of affluence, what kind of a social uh, hierarchy do you find yourself in, which may not have anything to do with your uh, working conditions necessarily, but also is a, a, a combination of various different uh, things like right from, for example, your uh, uh, the, the things that we were talking about in salutation, title, and prefix, uh, your heraldry, uh, or, or this idea of uh, this order of pre precedence, and that is something that is, you know, talked about over here. Um, nationality is, again, a very obvious um, question that is presented in uh, most uh, survey questions. And also, um, one of the ways in which we very recognizably understand uh, marginalization, discrimination, and otherness. Uh, there is a certain privilege attached to a certain uh, set of countries, a certain union of countries, uh, and of course there is a certain kind of uh, discrimination based on ethnicity and nationality as well. So this question of where are you from is a very sensitive uh, question to many people. It's also a question that is um, a form of a structural cultural violence. And um, this question, where are you from, is not really something that uh, many people are sensitive to when asking someone else. So um, the, the intention of putting it is, of course, to make participants aware of their own juxtaposition within this diversity of uh, nationalities. Um, if you select on any of these options, it basically gives you a democracy index. And this democracy index is the 2019 democracy index that uh, was released in January of 2020. Uh, the fact whether it's um, um, a flawed democracy or not, uh, uh, whether it's uh, um, um, a working democracy or a full democracy, or uh, whether it's authoritarian uh, um, state is, is part of that uh, democracy index study that was done. Uh, but also, mm, for example, um, let's look at uh, maybe, uh, 
have hmm. um, here you are uh, one particular example uh, whether it's recognized or disputed or not so uh, for me this is also this idea of okay this on, on a national level uh, how is national identity also something that is disputed uh, discussed uh, not a matter of uh, not something that one can take for granted and um, again moving on from nationality uh, country of origin again a question that is common so where are you from <laughs> is where are you really from um, again country of residence or if you are not like for me, my country of origin is India, and I'm currently living in or residing in uh, Finland. And so this question of uh, where are you from also translates for many people uh, as a question of why are you really here and what are you doing here? And um, that can be a very violent question for many people as well. So. I just wanted to put that in here as well. This is actually uh, this question. Are you from a nation previously undivided? Undivided <clears throat> is a is a question that you would find if you apply for a passport uh, for, for a, a passport in India. So a, a passport of Indian Indian nationality. And, and I find it a bit of a weird question. And but also a very interesting question because um, which country has been, is a country that is previously undivided? Uh, most countries, I think, I don't know, most countries have, have uh, in some way or the other uh, been part of different coalitions, different divisions. Uh, are federal uh, unions of uh, many kingdoms coming together, uh, so on and so forth. But this idea of unity and division and being divided or not, I think uh, is again a very important part of that discussion of uh, what does it mean to, to, to have say some kind of a, a purity of, of identity, purity of blood, purity, purity of uh, ethnicity, pure, like, um, this, this, this division and undivision is, is for me a connection towards that, uh, uh, that uh, stream of thinking or that thread of, of um, questioning. Um, yes, so then this idea of citizenship, at least for, for my country in India, is a very important uh, uh, or a relevant and a topical question because uh, this this idea of of citizenship has been through birth, descent, naturalization, asylum, economic citizenship for countries like uh, Malaysia is an option, and there are certain uh, excluded categories um, that that exist. You can have a look at that uh, in the notes, but. But these are forms which are by and large, largely recognized as ways in which you uh, acquire citizenship of a country. And um, the government of India right now is saying that none of these are, um, uh, are relevant markers. And a set of 26 different documents are required as proof of citizenship by the government of India currently. Uh, and this exercise has in part already begun in many states in India. So for me, at least as a citizen of, uh, of India, this, this idea of citizenship is, very, uh, is a very important question. Uh, but, but, for most, but for most of us or most of you out there, uh, this, this, this can be a question of um, of, of great um, um, economic psychological trauma as well. And uh, it's a very important question for many of us participating in this question, in this questionnaire, uh, to think about ways in which 
this idea of citizenship can be um, a form of violence and um, yeah again uh, this is a uh, these are questions that you would be this is a question that you would find in in a lot of uh, applications uh, visa applications uh, applications for but yes applications are for applying some for something so um, a passport uh, uh, bank job uh, or employment forms and things like that and um, this idea of a uh, criminal offense and uh, imprisonment is again a form of violence that extends into uh, in in many different ways across uh, questions um, just to kind of move through very quickly um, religious views and political views are both questions that uh, facebook asks uh, does not give any options for so uh, for me it was very important to give options for um, both of these uh, but also apart from religious views political views i included uh, economic views and sociological views and um, this was a way to kind of you know start thinking about how yes there is uh, religion and politics as something that we identify with uh, but the whole religious uh, socio political economic quadrangle is in fact the well the bermuda triangle of how uh, most of our discriminations uh, our, our uh, segregations our otherness can be defined uh, and at the same time things like political views religious views are very strong uh, markers of identity for for many of us and so it became very important for me to again present the participants with um, just this list of plurality that exists in each of these different questions um, and and some of these for me personally researching them across the last um, four years uh, I wouldn't have imagined uh, or, or I wasn't familiar with many of these different uh, options um, with this anarchism, for example. And so uh, for me, this has also been a journey of uh, really teaching myself, um, has been a journey of really discovering the, 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 the major information overload that exists but some but also um, that these are all very important things for each of us to know and be aware of and be sensitive to and so I hope that you will share in my feeling of of, uh, of, of really being excited to uh, be presented with this uh, plethora of information and really revel in it get lost in it take your time with uh, just moving through these various different um, not not just options I think at this point of time uh, they are their identities ways in which uh, people uh, very strongly anchor their own lives to and around and uh, maybe this is just a way for us to or a way for me to bring the participants of this questionnaire one step closer to um, to just create a community of people who are sensitive to, uh, to, to a lot of these different forms of information and, and really just bring forward a, a kind of a knowledge system uh, a knowledge system that enables a certain form of articulation um, because for many of us, I think a lot of these um, aspects of, of our identity are also difficult to articulate. Uh, I don't expect, I don't, I don't think anybody expects that any of the, uh, the questions are very straightforward and easy to just move through and uh, respond to very quickly. Uh, these are all uh, ideas and concepts that we are all struggling with. And I think um, my primary idea is also to just simply 
present a space for the articulation of that um, that uh, that diversity of one's own identity experience and so um, at this point of time I think it is important to ask the participants what is your state of mind because um, the, 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 the series of questions are designed to elicit a certain sense of realization of the ways in which um, of the ways in which violence has become a very important part of our everyday experience but to also you know say that hey there are a lot of different information uh, a lot of different um, states of emotion and emotional experiences and to really just ask people to pause I think this is what this particular section is aimed to do so I'm gonna move towards that and of course ask this very silly question or this um, this uh, this question of uh, have you ever previously submitted a survey form and and to just make people realize that you know even these questions are not this is not the first time that you would have been asked this e even in a in, in a format of a survey or, or a form or a survey questionnaire and and to just you know, um, point you in the direction of the fact that this is this is a sim uh, that this is actually a part of our experience or of living that we have uh, that we cannot move away from. That we are going to be uh, asked these questions very frequently. Um, for me, this is. The, the, this and the question after this are uh, the most interesting or important uh, uh, parts of, of this questionnaire. So have you been in direct or indirect contact with forms of violence in your life? And um, this is, of course, again, uh, a primer to the fact, uh, not not the fact, but a primer to the, uh, the the questions that follow uh, just to kind of you know uh, ask you to think about or reflect on uh, what violence really means or can mean and so the next question is the nature of violence that you may have experienced as a person who has been expressed uh, sorry as, as be, um, the nature of violence you may have experienced as a person oppressed by those forms of violence and what are those different forms of violence? Uh, um, uh, what does that list look like? Is this? And um, this, this list ranges from uh, culturally uh, normalized forms of violence uh, to, to uh, minor infractions to uh, physical violences like um, hitting, uh, bullying, um, to to large uh, to to or beating, uh, biting, uh, to to more uh, acute or more um, intense uh, forms of violence like uh, assault, battery, uh, manslaughter, homicide, uh, and then moving from physical violence to uh, gendered violence, sexual violence, um, emotional um, and psychological violence, spiritual violence, um, also. Um, looking at the different categories of um, self-inflicted violence, interpersonal violence, and collective violence, um, and and what that means is that um, interpersonal violence as being vi forms of violence that you may experience um, either as a form of intimate partner violence or domestic violence, or um, essentially. Uh, a form of violence from one to another or on a one-on-one -on -one basis um, violence uh, against the elderly or elderly or elder abuse or child abuse is a form of interpersonal violence or then collective violence and forms of violence um, that are political social uh, and political violence political collective violence for example are um, war or um, 
uh, um, collective violence is racism, uh, misogyny, sexism, uh, things like that. Um, and and the, the importance, at least to me, in, in really articulating this, uh, this list is, is also to, to be basically be able to say that, hey, uh, in most um, ways in which we understand forms of violence would be broken up and fragmented across a range of different platforms. Uh, you never really understand that kind of a breadth and depth of the different forms of violence that exist around us every day uh, in different intensities and different ways uh, that, that and, and how exactly does this surround us. Um, cyber violence or, or uh, trolling and the different forms of trolling or what are the different war crimes. Um, and, and most importantly, you don't find this kind of an articulation in most uh, legal um, policies. So, for example, uh, the Indian um, law uh, regarding domestic and sexual violence simply articulates that to be physical, sexual, um, uh, bodily, uh, emotional violence against a person. Uh, that to me doesn't really um, indicate any kind of a sense of what, but what are those forms of violence supposed to look like? Uh, how do they manifest themselves in reality? How do they manifest themselves in, in action? And so this is a way for me to articulate that and for people to really understand uh, what um, different forms of violence really look like and mean across the the context of direct structural and and cultural contexts and uh, again you can go through what uh, these different options uh, mean um, many of these options are not uh, do not have notes because uh, they are fairly uh, self um, uh, self indicative um, these are a bit graphic, so I would definitely recommend that you, um, well, that I, I, I should put some kind of a, a trigger warning here, uh, which I will, um, but just really want to acknowledge that and state that it is difficult for many people to just uh, even go through this, but I hope that you will and uh, talk to me or talk to, um, well, um, write to me uh, or, or strike up some kind of a conversation if you feel that you want to talk about it. Um, and uh, the next question is the nature of violence that you may have experienced as a perpetrator of that violence or an oppressor. And the list is the same. And in many, um, for many people who have actually participated previously, uh, what has been really interesting for me to uh, to know when I when they have approached me and talked to me about it is that uh, many different forms of violence that they have experienced as a person oppressed, um, even if it is some something as simple as being yelled to by a person. Who, who is in a, a senior position at work by their boss uh, as a form of, of violence that they have experienced. Uh, they have realized through this participation that uh, they also, you know, do, do the same thing to a person who is um, uh, socially or economically at a lower end. Uh, so where they have been yelled at by their boss, they may have yelled at a person who's driving their car or uh, who's working in their home or something like that. And so this idea that uh, this relationship between being a victim or a survivor uh, and an oppressor of violence is not an absolute or a binary relationship, that it is a relationship that is in flux, in, <coughs> in flux I'm sorry, uh, and that we can find ourselves on different uh, parts of that uh, uh, different sides of that position uh, very quickly and in very, it's very easy 
for it to be interchangeable and so i think this uh, for me is one of the most important um realizations that i could hope people or participants have uh in the process of participating in this survey uh that this 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 entire spectrum of um um life with identities this entire spectrum of of forms of violence and our relationship to it is not set in stone it's not binary uh that it is a very um fluid uh, sliding scale and that we can uh find ourselves uh on different parts of that scale or that spectrum if we are not sufficiently sensitive to what forms of violence may look feel like and how they can be experienced differently so then the last question and the most important question or maybe the reason why you are actually answering these uh, different questions is to ask you what according to you is the color of violence and uh, this very much is related to that initial uh, reasoning of why this project started uh, with this idea of saffron terror and um, the simplification of black being a color of violence uh here participants are presented with uh this photoshop style color picker and you can select any color that you want uh and essentially these these uh, colors or this color range is presenting people with 256 million colors so you can actually choose from any of these and the idea is that um you then also perhaps share why you have chosen uh this particular color that is your choice of color at the end of it and and it it really is to um say that this this um color of violence um as a aspect of 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 one's experience is a highly subjective uh is a highly subjective um experience uh it is a highly subjective and individualistic um um uh, selection of color uh so so when then this becomes an archive of um just kind of go here uh, when then we are saying that this is an archive of color and it is fairly a, a very diverse um uh archive of color what does it mean in terms of its legitimacy and its credibility and so the so its legitimacy uh, sorry its legitimacy is in actually celebrating the diversity of of experience that each of the participants bring to the table bring to uh the the completion of this survey and actually what then happens is that this um these colors actually become a a kind of a data set uh or a complex data set of each of these 50 questions that you answered before that uh and in a way becomes representative of that very complex diverse uh set of identities that actually make up your identity so um this is then the last uh, question of the question is what follows after our uh, simply ways in which uh, we can get in touch with you or how you can share um, this uh, color and um, well this this color and um, this response of why you have selected the color how you can maybe share and um, i hope you do share and uh, help me spread this um across uh, across uh, your friend circles your family circles your network because it, i i feel i personally feel that it is a very important series of questions to uh to to answer and just to be confronted with and i hope that everybody each one of you uh participates in this questionnaire and uh, well technically the last two questions are 
asking for some feedback. So um, I hope that you will write back to us and share your experience, uh, anything that you think that we can improve, uh, any requests that you may have, anything that we may have overlooked uh, that you can suggest um, how, yes, how we can improve. I already said that. And uh, essentially, mm, if you would like to remain or stay updated about this project in the future, if uh, you would like to, you know, uh, in some way, um, find ways in which we can work on this together, if you would like to participate beyond just uh, completing this uh, questionnaire, uh, please uh, check, the, check this box. And don't forget to submit the questionnaire. And uh, I hope to see your response over here soon. We have 217 different participants already over here. And hey, if you have done the first version of the, uh, the questionnaire, please uh, participate again because it is a completely different experience. And um, many of you may have participated um, two or three years ago and so it would be good to have an update on what you now think is a color of violence and uh, so I hope that you will participate again and uh, yeah that's um, well that's it for me from me uh, regarding the questionnaire if you want to know more about uh, where the project has been exhibited before uh, I will be doing a talk about uh, that and the whole journey of uh, um, how, how this has been a, a collaborative experience um, between me and uh, specifically Palash Mukhopadhyay. We will be doing a conversation with him at some point of time in the coming weeks uh, to just understand his perspective of having worked on this project for the last uh, three years and the various iterations that we have gone uh, through together and um, his own background in, in, in uh, uh, as a UX designer and as, an, uh, as a person who has been instrumental in, in, in creating a certain visual vocabulary for the user experience that you will, uh, that you will experience. It is, I think, an important um, conversation to hear from him his entire experience of it. Uh, but next Saturday, we will be doing a conversation with Timo Turkinen and talking about um, uh, digital creativity and uh, how, for me, it is a very important um, part of my own practice to, to, to look at online spaces as, um, as, as sites of exhibition but also the online as an archive and, and the online as a, um, a site of archiving as an arch artistic practice. And so that is something that we will be doing next Saturday. So please join us again for that. And um, yeah, this is it. I will leave you to participate uh, now and um, hope to see you online soon. Thank you.